All right, I'm going to introduce uh, David Coulier. How we're going to do this is I'm going to introduce uh, Dave, and he's going to do a, a presentation um, giving us a glimpse of what's coming out of this next report that he's working on um, about the universe of the FOI organizations, and really, I guess, beyond the FOI organizations. Um, anyone who's working in this space here, is he will uh, provide some more information about. You can read about uh, Dave and his bio and the program there, but let me all just mention a couple things. Um, in March of 2017, when we were being hosted by the Tennessee Coalition for Open Government in Nashville, um, Dave presented uh, a latest report, this first report he did for the Knight Foundation called Forecasting Freedom of Information, Why It Faces Problems and How Experts Say They Could Be Solved. Um, he talked about the report there in Nashville, and, uh, and now he's following up that two years later with another report called Mapping the Civic Data Universe, 10 Ways to Improve Access to Government Information Through Expanded Interstellar Connections. I feel like we should have the Star Trek theme playing in the background here. So, uh, report represents second and final installment commissioned by the Knight Foundation to identify barriers for journalists and for citizens and access government information and to seek potential solutions. And uh, we are fortunate to be among the first to hear these findings in public. And, um, and we look forward to this conversation. And we certainly look forward, we want to make this an interactive discussion. And so we're looking for feedback from you all as we get through this process in here in terms of what Dave is going to provide. So Dave, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks, Dan. I appreciate it. And um, I hope during this time, as, as we're chatting, um, jot down thoughts that come to you on two things. What potential new funders might be out there that aren't the usual suspects? You know, so, so if you think of, and maybe you have some unusual funders for your coalition, um, just jot it down. Also, what potential partners can you identify uh, that would be unique and outside of the box? Not the usual suspects. So that's the, the goal of this session, is to really kind of expand our thinking over what we could do, who we could do it with, and um, how we can get more money and funding and be self-sustaining. Um, is that an issue for anyone here? Uh, okay, yeah, I, th I think that that's a major issue for coalitions. So that's the goal, that, that you leave uh, this session with some ideas to take back and apply and see where we can go from here. So uh, thanks to the Knight Foundation for um, uh, commissioning this, these, these studies. I think they're, they're really important. And uh, Nick Sweeter from Knight will be here tomorrow, so um, thank him if you see him. Uh, in fact, their support for this conference is really critical, and of course for NFOIC. So this report, again, uh, as uh, Dan mentioned, follows on the one two years ago where I uh, interviewed a, a, a hundreds, uh, surveyed hundreds of FOIA people, some of you in here, interviewed a, a bunch, uh, 60 or 70 if I remember, and um, basically laid out all the problems everyone was seeing and how it was going to get worse. And one thing kept coming up all the time. Everybody kept mentioning, we really need to work together better. We're, we're in silos. Uh, we, need, we need to partner more. And um, so that got me thinking, what is out there? Who are our potential partners? A lot of our organizations emerged from journalism, right? Uh, raise of hands, how many of your coalitions are, kind of came out of journalism or journalism-centric? Right, it, um, I'm a former journalist. Uh, it was just natural. Journalists kind of led the way to the passage of FOIA. Uh, but things are changing now. Things are changing a lot. And uh, we're going to talk about this. So this report, I'm, I can't tell you when it'll be out with all the details and the maps and that sort of thing, uh, and the data. Uh, hundreds of organizations, a database I'm building that any people will be able to see. Um, I'm still working on that, still piecing together some things, and I'll be talking to, reaching out to some of the coalitions to piece together things as well. And I identified about a dozen galaxies in this universe. It's what seemed to pop out as I looked and I clumped things together. And there's some overlap. Uh, not everything's perfect, but I could kind of throw a dozen different kind of galaxies that are kind of distinct. 
There are links between them, and we'll talk about that, but for the most part, they kind of operate in their own little space. Um, of course, we have the journalism galaxy, and there are more than 60 journalism organizations kind of uh, hovering around. Uh, there are big planets, little planets. Uh, there, are, there are hubs. Reporters Committee, of course, is a major hub, which also has links to other galaxies. Uh, we'll also talk about that. But, uh, of course, the traditional journalism galaxy. And, and uh, so some of those planets are becoming uh, imploding on themselves, right? Um, the journalism is uh, having a tough time. Uh, SPJ, for example, 100 and some years old. Uh, but, um, uh, and I, I was former SPJ president. Um, it's not a growing organization in membership or, or budget. And, um, and, and it's typical of a lot of journalism nonprofits and their ability to fight for access. Uh, but while other journalism groups like Reporters Committee is booming, and I, I'm going to show you some of the, the data on this uh, in a minute, um, doing all sorts of things like FOIA Wiki, thanks to Adam Marshall, all his work. Where is Adam? Raise your hand. Adam, good job. You know, he's really working hard. And, and, um, and so, so these kind of things that uh, they're doing is great. The Press Freedom Fund, uh, First Look Media, kind of came out of the blue and a lot of people aren't even aware of it. Tons of money, tons of action, uh, tons of work that they're working on to fight for, for, for government accountability. And then you have the corporate galaxy and, and you know, Socrata and NextRequest and these other folks and a lot more groups to add to this, some, some of which we've heard from today. Uh, they play a big part in this and, and we're seeing today how that's important. Uh, even, even like uh, BRB, you know, these kind of companies that are designed to collect information and provide it for people who need it for employment screening or what have you. Uh, we typically have not worked with these groups very closely. And, um, and, and these are new avenues that we should explore. And I'm sure some of you have or tried. Of course, tech, tech is emerging. And, and this has been a tricky area. Hands down, everybody says they've been frustrated at getting Facebook, Google, whoever involved in these efforts. And so far, they have not been excited. But there are ways of, of, of changing that, I think. There are ways of getting in those doors through what motivates them now. And Google actually is spending more money in this direction. And we have potential of, of uh, working together uh, for our, our common good. Um, MuckRock is, is, of course, an exemption, uh, exception to this. Great. Michael Morrissey couldn't make it here today. but. Uh, uh, just amazing tech, and they keep adding apps. They're, they're, they're adding new products all the time. Um, uh, definitely a partner uh, for coalitions, as well as FOIA Mapper and other tools and doodads and gigas, Maplite, that have uh, arose and been kind of popular over the past five to 10 years. Um, and not to mention Google Dataset Search, that just came out uh, late last fall. Uh, so Google is moving in this direction. Um, all right, civil society. This is a huge galaxy, and it's growing. And um, it's, it's amazing how many civil society groups right now are interested in public records. A lot of them are requesting public records, FOIA primarily. Uh, they're driven to find out what's going on in immigration because they deal with immigration. Uh, and they, they're banding together, uh, coordinated by Open the Government and federal type uh, groups, not so much at the state and local level, but there's potential there. There are state and local level chapters of these groups, the public interest research groups, the PERGs, you know, League of Women Voters, you know them, some of these folks who are active in your communities. Uh, this is a growing sphere. and. There's more interest in public records and data from these groups and, and lots of potential here. Uh, as I mentioned, Open the Government, which is, uh, which is on the rise. Open the Government, I think, is going very strong, doing very well, uh, keeps doing great work. Other groups like Electronic Frontier Foundation, a lot of symbiosis we have with them. Again, mostly at the federal level, 
But there's, as I talk to executive directors in these groups, they keep talking about how they want to move to the state local level. Uh, I kept hearing this over and over and over. There is interest among these groups to, to move into the state local level. Crew uh, is another example of one of those groups. Even things like Detention Watch Network, which few people here probably even heard of that. I hadn't heard of it before this. Very interested in public records because it helps them do their job. These are the, the partners that we may have uh, in getting information. Uh, citizen archivists, I call them. These people who, uh, in their jammies in their basements, are requesting records and putting them online uh, just out of the goodness of their own hearts. I mean, I'm talking about um, uh, altgov.2, or uh, altgov2, it used to be called Memory Hole, started by Russ Kick, this uh, author in Tucson, uh, back in 2003, I think. And he was foying all sorts of records and throwing them up there. He was the one who got the photos from the Pentagon of coffins coming back from uh, Iraq, uh, you know, draped in flags, those pictures that uh, became a big issue. He's the one who cut those records loose. And, um, and he had many other requests that news organizations jumped on. And he works with some journalists and others. And um, he needs help. He needs money. Because he, he doesn't have a, he, he won't mind me saying, but I mean, he sacks out at my place sometimes. You know, uh, uh, and he does Kickstarter. You know, to, to help keep funded. These kind of folks have passion, and uh, we need to uh, build on that. Uh, of course, the government galaxies, archivists, librarians, these folks. The library galaxy is not doing well. It's very similar to journalism. Their associations, you see, look at their 990s, going down, 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 their revenues. Very similar to the journalism galaxy in a lot of ways. Um, but uh, there are a lot of potential, of course, and there are government folks in this room. Very good partners. Uh, we, we, we should build on OGIS, mediation type uh, entities, that sort of thing. A new galaxy that's kind of really exploded is the law clinics that you've heard about. Now, the Yale Law Clinic was bubbling along for a long time, doing great work. Uh, kicking out law students who went out, got went to universities, and started some of their own law clinics. Got a, got, had about a half dozen of them around the country, um, and now they're exploding for a couple reasons. One, it, a lot of people have identified litigation as an important um, uh, task, something that's really needed in this sphere. Uh, and so there have, have been some donors and foundations putting money to this, enticing universities to create these law clinics and law schools where law students litigate for records uh, under the mentorship of professors. Uh, well, uh, Reporters Committee got, was brilliant by getting a grant to hire Josh over here, Josh Moore, um, who's a former intern from the Student Press Law Center who was directed by Frank, who now is at Breckner. We are an incestuous group. It's crazy. Well, Josh, anyway, starting in October, I believe, has been tasked with coordinating the law clinics, with enhancing their communication, with bringing them together, with doing training, what have you. He would probably explain more. Uh, but, uh, uh, and he just told me today, there's like 15 or 16 of them now. They're just popping up like uh, daffodils in the spring. It's, uh, it's amazing. And, and the, you know, these are potentially powerful allies with journalists because he's linking them with journalism groups, uh, investigative news, nonprofit, nonprofit news network, whatever that group is, I forget, and others. And certainly, I think there's potential for NFYC and coalitions to partner and that sort of thing. Very good possibilities, not to mention academic um, organizations like Breckner at the University of Florida and others. I um, uh, mentioned Yale, others, Syracuse track, National Security Archive. Can't 
go without mentioning National Security Archive, Tom Blanton and Nate Jones, who's also here. Thanks for coming, Nate, presenting a paper today at, at the reception, uh, which, I, which is awesome. In fact, a little cheap plug, make sure at the reception there'll be eight posters uh, with their authors explaining their cool studies, standing there with their glass of wine, and you can walk up and look at what they're doing and talk with them and chat with them and get ideas. Um, of course, the state coalitions are a whole galaxy. Uh, it ebbs and flows, grows and shrinks. Right now it's starting to grow again, thanks to the hiring of Kelsey, a staffer, uh, a lot of pressure, Kelsey. Um, but, uh, but she's doing a great job and uh, there's a lot of potential here for NFOIC, I, I think so. Um, uh, it's really come a long ways just in the past year or two in the move to Florida, in the new website, new logo, new staff. Um, we really, really should thank Dan and Mal and Mark Horvitt for their work in really shifting this. Good job, guys. Good job. Uh, yeah. And um, with any luck, we'll, um, there'll be even more money for coalitions, pass through grants and other incentives down the road. That's the goal. Uh, funders, new funders moving in uh, to the realm. And a lot of funders outside that we're not aware of, but are also interested in the issues uh, that, uh, that we could tap into. So. Um, so think about funders that might not be the standard ones. Of course, Knight has always been there, more or less, supporting us as best they can, uh, supporting the cause, they support journalism. Uh, Democracy Fund, a rising uh, donor, uh, Coke has moved in, other, f other folks, Soros, uh, in the global level particularly. Uh, but we have an opportunity for some other, other types of folks to help out. Um, all right, so you have this universe, and there are lots of connectors between them, uh, and there's a lot of walls that are drifting off partly uh, without knowing what's going on with each other. So what are some key takeaways? One thing I noticed was just there's a shift and change in terminology going on. Uh, we see the open data crowd out there uh, that have been talking open data, open data, and they realize, well, you can't have open data if you can't get the data. Oh, you can't put stuff online if the government won't give it to you. You can't, you can't use Google to, tools to analyze it if you can't get it. So these folks are now saying, well, we need to get the government to give us this data, to release it. And so they're more interested in FOI. You look at the FOI world, Freedom of Information, and we're talking more about proactive dissemination of data and how that's really an important solution to our woes. And so if you, you look at Google searches for, from 2004 to the present, the blue line are searches for the term Freedom of Information. Now look at that line. You see the, the line that's red for the searches on open data. Well, that's going up. Uh, open data searches now, uh, they exceeded, started exceeding freedom of information searches in uh, 2016. So uh, we have a shift in terminology. Uh, and we have to adapt to that. Because if we run around and just say freedom of information all the time, it's not going to resonate. They don't even know what we're talking about. So, so either we have to co-opt the term open data or create a new term or do something else. But if we're gonna resonate with legislators and the public and, and funders, um, we're gonna have to reevaluate how we talk about this a little because things are shifting fast. Uh, Trump bump. This was very apparent with federally oriented groups. Huge bumps, and we'll see a few examples. Uh, how about uh, state coalitions, huge bump? Probably not, maybe a little, but most of the coalitions I talked to said not really seeing it trickle down to the state level. Uh, but can the coalitions and the state level build on that? Can they use 
disinformation, fake news, that emphasis, which is hot right now, especially among funders, um, and translate that to good information, government information, uh, the release of good information. You know, that's something we should think about. Uh, and we look at the revenue change in the past, from 2014 to 17, so f about a four year period, I, I went through everybody's 990s um, and I broke it out and I said, well, who's on the rise in revenue and who's on the decline and, and that sort of thing. And I won't single anybody out here, um, but uh, what we see is civil society uh, galaxy as a whole is, um, is averaging about almost 70%, almost 70% uh, increase in revenues in just that four year period. Uh, that's before Trump and then after. Um, journalism, you see it's almost a 60% increase that time, but hold that, put, put a pin in that. I'm gonna have to come back to that uh, with a caveat. And coalitions are down there under 30%. Not much rise among the coalitions in income and revenue during this period. Not seeing that Trump bump like other groups are, these other galaxies. And like, so thinking of journalism here, you take out four of the journalism groups and basically it's flat. And most journalism groups are on the decline revenue wise. Um, but there are really only four driving it. One is the Freedom of the uh, Press Foundation. That's the yellow line. Um, they're up to, they've jumped from about a million to six million dollars in revenue during that four year period. Reporters Committee, about almost two million to more than four million. They've, they've, they've doubled their revenue, annual revenue, in that four year period. Reporters Committee is hot right now. They're sizzling hot. Their executive director has sore arms carrying that wheelbarrow full of money. Bruce Brown, and, and he's earned it. Um, and then the National Press Club, interestingly, has, has uh, gone, gone up. Um, uh, ups and downs a little bit, but they're heading up. But the big one is ProPublica. Uh, they went from $10 million in annual revenue in 2014, and they're, they're almost uh, bringing in $45 million a year in annual revenue. $45 million. Can you, can you imagine if we just got a little smidgen of that? And, and they're doing a lot of what we do. They're requesting records, they're getting data, they're putting it online, they're doing all sorts of great things, they share it. And then you look at the civil society bonanza, like where the money's really going over this four year period, it's POGO the Project on Government Oversight. Um, they're up to $7 million now, 180% increase. R Street, up to $6 million. They've doubled their revenue. Global Witness, $15 million, 300% increase in four years. Brennan Center, up to $24 million. They've, they've almost tripled their, their revenue, 175%. Or, yep. Um, Center for Constitutional Rights, Color of Change. Judicial Watch, $53 million in revenue, almost doubled their revenue in four years. So there is a lot of money going into this realm, and a lot of it's for litigation, a lot of it's for federal FOIA, but there are, there are crossovers and there's interest in moving to the state level. How much do you think the total revenue for all the FOI co coalitions in this country, the entire United States of America, Take a wild guess, the greatest country in the world, right? We are great again, right? And take a guess. A million, two million, seven hundred fifty thousand. Really good guesses, about two million. So all the coalitions in this country of America combined to all we need is an endowment of what? $50 million? Let me do the math. Yeah, about $50 million. And, and uh, we're set with just the basics. $2 million. That is peanuts compared to what all these other groups are getting, right? 
We need a piece of that. And, and you all deserve a piece of that. The other things I noticed are there's some crowded lanes. A lot of groups doing training, a lot of groups do, uh, requesting records at the federal level, not so much at the state local level, not a lot of activity there, it's all federal. Litigation at the federal level, that's very hot right now, and federal, federal advocacy, but nothing at the state level hardly to speak of uh, among a lot of these groups, but there's interest in it. Uh, there are gaps, there are voids, there are black holes. Uh, strategic research is something that came up. People wanted more data so they could, one, uh, justify better laws and openness and that sort of thing. But they want data and research that matters. They, they want something that's useful. And a lot of the coalitions do excellent jobs gathering data to help in their cause. Um, technology is still a gap. Even though it was the shiny object for the past five years among funders in particular, um, it's still a gap. We're still not there. We have a long ways to go. And it's, there's still a lot of interest in it. Uh, public education was identified as a gap. Very little going on with public education. It just seems probably so insurmountable. Now, of course, coalitions do that all the time, especially, and that's important. And that, that's where coalition, coalitions have a chance to own that lane, to stake it out and own it. Uh, and of course, lobbying and policy change at the state level, it's really up to you and press associations for the most part. I mean, no, and press associations are hurting, right? Because their members are hurting. And so with the press associations having a tougher time, it falls on coalitions. No one else is gonna do it. It's, it's really up to the coalitions now. Um, and often we partner with the press associations, right? But um, uh, this, that is the huge gap. And there, funders are ambivalent about funding that. There's not a, as much interest in throwing out a lot of money for lobbying at the state level for some reason. It's kind of um, something, it's a tough nut to crack. New Frontiers. Here's what came out of this. And the, again, this was from interviews with a lot of people. Um, a lot of people said, what's up with Sunshine Week? Where, where is that anyway? Um, and there have been attempts to try to reinvigorate it. There was a proposal to make it basically year round. And you know, that may be something that needs to be done. But someone has to grab that and run with that. I don't know who right now, uh, American Society of News Editors kind of runs out with the Associated Press, but uh, it's kind of on life support. I have to figure out what to do. SunCon, or whatever we want to call it. There is no national convention for FOI in this country, right? Can you think of any gathering where everybody interested in state level, federal level, from requester side, from government side, from you know, academic research. There, we don't have a national FOI convention. And no one has really tried it that I know of. There are little ones. Chicago has a FOIA fest. It's, again, journalistic centric and uh, that sort of thing. But, and of course, this summit is great. But uh, is there someone who can create a national conference where everybody comes together, learns from each other, still has their own little tracks? Maybe that's someone NFOIC could do. I don't know. Maybe not. Citizen links. We need to link up these citizen archivists with groups and, get, and harness their energy. Make that uh, productive. There's a lot of energy there. People in your states that you know. Strategic research. Uh, the Breckner Center uh, is starting to move into this realm, thanks to Frank. And has the Breckner Center has been doing it for decades. Uh, with Bill Chamberlain, anybody knew Bill? Great guy, he retired. And um, so uh, there has to be a little bit more of that. Uh, I call this a sunshine switchboard. It's not very modern. Um, it's not hip. There's probably a better term. I'm open to ideas. But uh, the idea is we have all these galaxies and we don't communicate very well. And it's difficult. 
I mean, can you really communicate with 11 other galaxies and keep track of that? And how many of you have listservs right, that you actually read every day? Maybe a few. But we, we can't keep track of all that. And we need someone to help look and see what's going on out there and match make and say, hey, they're doing what you're doing. You guys should talk, this sort of thing. So, so there has to be a communication device to increase the communication and collaborations among these galaxies. It just isn't happening right now, except in some, some, some situations. Um, we really need a state's policy center. We need an organization that identifies what legislation is effective in public records law, uh, identify low-hanging fruit in the states, states that are ripe for in introducing this legislation, and then working it through the system systematically across the country. Uh, we are not doing that now. We have some good efforts at the federal level with FOIA, uh, fairly good and strategic uh, efforts to get FOIA amendments passed every 10 years, but we don't have a mechanism to get systematic change in throughout the country. Uh, that makes sense. Uh, that's an opportunity, it's a gap. Uh, state litigation. Again, we don't have a good uh, lawyer uh, or a set of lawyers running around uh, doing the kind of litigation that is really necessary or a mechanism to do that. We only have so much money. There are efforts to do that. I think the Reporters Committee is getting more involved at the state level. Um, of course, we, a lot of states have media hotlines and pro bono attorneys and everybody who helps out, but, uh, but it isn't very coordinated and, um, and it could be more effective. Uh, that's something that uh, is a gap and an opportunity. Uh, state endowments, I'm coming back to this. If just one of those guys on that screen, one of those white guys, on that screen, um, or two or three of them, chipped in just their, the pocket change that's under their couch cushions. Uh, think of what could happen to endow every state's uh, coalition work. For example, if, if they chipped in for 500 million, all right, you're saying that's crazy, Dave. That's ludicrous. They would never give 500 million to a cause. Yeah, they have. They've given billions to causes. And so if we can just get 500 million, for example, and I don't think that's, that's really out, out of whack, but you know, it's difficult. Endow it, that generates $25 million a year in interest. Set up $2 million endowments for each state. Every state within four years has a $2 million endowment that generates eighty to $100,000 in base level support for an executive director. So executive directors don't have to run around all day trying to raise money just to pay themselves. And in most of our coalitions, they're not even paid, if that, right? Every state has one dedicated person to lead the charge, raise more money, get more staff, build their state's coalition, but at least there's a foundation. At least they can focus. How many of you would love to be able to focus on the mission rather than getting your salary? Anybody? Yeah. Jeff? Nah. You love raising money for your salary so you can eat. So, so and, and I've talked to some funders and some folks in the foundation world, and they, they do not think this is pie in the sky. They think this is possible if there can be a good argument a good case to be made that, that uh, makes it worthwhile. We have to think big. We have to go beyond the current situation. All right, so based on that, sorry Dan, went a little long. Um, let's talk, um, happy to get ideas. Dan, let's chat a little bit. And by the way, if, if anything I said was stupid, feel free to bring it up, yeah, and just say, yeah, yeah, right. Well, first uh, of all, let me thank you for that report, and um, 
that throwing down the gauntlet, I like that one. <laughs> we have some challenges in front of us to do as well. Uh, big because, challenges. Yeah, some big challenges. Um, let, me, let me ask you, uh, before we open it up to the audience there, I, just a couple, couple of questions here. Um, you had mentioned in your report that the galaxies tend to stay amongst themselves in, in operating there. And I'm just curious if you can amplify a little bit more about some of the inherent or cultural circumstances that might exist within these galaxies um, that have pre prevented better co-mingling um, of these different galaxies with each other. Um, you know, how can we approve, you know, since we're all working, you know, towards a similar goal here? Well, I mean, it's mostly inertia, right? Uh, even our organizations, we bubbled up out of the goo in our own little way, and that's all we know. And um, we, we don't come in contact with um, a lot of these other folks too often. And so um, it's not that we're, we're just busy, right? There's only so much bandwidth. And so that's part of it. People are just in their own little worlds doing their thing. They don't have time to go run around, look and see what, who else might be interested in working with them. So, um, and of course, there are some other, you know, uh, cultural differences between galaxies. Um, journalists may not always work hand in hand joyfully with government um, archivists and government officials. Those two galaxies, you know, there's some crossover, but it's a little trickier. Right. But, uh, you know, it's, it's getting there. And, and before I open it up for the audience, uh, you know, one of the big things that, you know, going back uh, a couple of decades to this Gov 2.0 and this emerging technology into this area here where we were looking at uh, this new form of technology that would literally close this chasm between the citizens and their government and what we've seen almost as a, as a inverse, in, the chasm has widened in those areas there. Um, how conscious do we have to be of what's going on in technology? You know, Doug had talked about, you know, a lot of these shifts of giving things out to the private sector that used to be publicly st uh, stewards of that were the public sector. How much is technology going to continue to drive this universe that you've explored? Yeah, probably even more so. I mean, I mean, I mean look at what's happened. Um, when it was a shiny object 10 years ago, Sunlight Foundation was huge and Code for America, and all these folks running around, it was hot, there was money going to it, and then sunlight kind of imploded a little, and um, other groups kind of did, but they dispersed. And now it's getting kind of routinized in, inside of governments, it's starting to spread. Folks like Next Request and these other portal companies and others, I think, are spreading things. and. Um, I think we have to embrace it. It's where the overlap's starting. Uh, certainly with the diminishment of the, the influence of journalism or, or traditional mainstream news legacy media, uh, other folks are, 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 are filling those gaps. And it's primarily the tech sector. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right, well, let's, let's open it up to the audience here if there's some other comments or questions. David asked you to think about a couple of questions when he started his presentation here. We'd love to hear your all's thoughts and ideas. I'm particularly interested in, in how to improve and advance the, the state coalition galaxy out there as well, but certainly any other thoughts in that uh, that could improve upon Dave's work here uh, for something to take back in his final editing. Anyone? In the back. Nate Jones. Uh, I think uh, <clears throat> for most of what you're getting at, I might just mention one more that you probably thought of that just, just a good crack is um, in all levels, I think there's a really need for some type of more effective rapid response to legislation um, that puts in always seem to do exceptions and often the bad guys do a pretty good job of um, hiding in the last second and often we don't do a good enough job of fighting Absolutely. I mean, uh, there needs to be a state's policy network organization that's monitoring legislation in all the states, and NFYC is actually moving in that direction, um, that uh, grooms, trains, helps coalitions understand effective lobbying techniques, and people like Tom Sussman are experts in that. We have a lot of folks here, you all are experts in lobbying. You, a lot of you do it all the time. 
Um, and, and then coordinating that nationally in some way to help spread good, le uh, good, um, good legislation. In the next session, I'm going to mention some components of state laws that seem to actually affect better compliance. Uh, we need to focus on those things. You know, Dave, you mentioned the, uh, in the journalism um, galaxy that there are a few of those organizations that have spiked. If you remove those from there, it kind of stayed flat. The funding that went into those particular groups, there was pretty much a, a, a special interest to be able to be completed through those advancements of funds that focused on litigation services. Um, but we've been talking about the legislative side, and as our board president, Mal Leary, has said, it all starts with a bad bill and then goes down from there. Uh, where do you see that going in terms of more holistic approach to generating some of these reforms that have to happen within the legislative branch and the executive branch as well? Even though we know litigation is, is a very, very, very important tool that we have to have and be able to use to, to enact these reforms, there's a couple of other areas here that really seem to be missing out on some of the attention that it should get. Yeah, are you talking about legislation? Yeah. Yeah, focusing yeah. there on, on some of the early efforts. Um, I mean, you know, certainly the legislation is a result of these bad bills that become bad laws and bad policies. Um, what are some of the, how can some of these galaxies work to be able to address some of these other areas um, on the legislative side? Well, I mean, I, I guess what I mentioned earlier with, um, with uh, a coordinating policy network uh, to just ride on that and be on it because um, litigation is reactionary and it's expensive and if we can cut it off at the pass we save a lot of time and energy uh, and, and we need to focus on the legislatures that's where it starts we got to get good law we need to litigate too I mean that's part of the whole our whole system but um, uh, there's a lot of emphasis on throwing money at litigation when we might be able to do some other tweaks that uh, uh, that uh, don't allow us to have to spend our money that way. For example, and I'll mention it later, attorney fee shifting provisions in state laws. Attorney fee sh shifting provisions are very powerful. If you have them in laws, uh, uh, attorneys, you won't have to come up with money to hire an attorney to take a good case to court. Attorneys will volunteer to do it because they might get paid uh, if, they, if they prevail. And if it's a good case, they're more likely to do that. So you don't need money for litigation if you tackle it from that route instead. That's kind of the strategy that we need to look at to, to, to use our limited resources wisely, I think. Which is something you came as one of your recommendations from your 2017 report. That came out, that popped out a lot of people, including at the summit last fall. Uh, I think it was Terry Mutchler um, and the other speaker, the, the count, general counsel from Gannett, I think. Yes. Or some, they both said, attorney fee shifting. That's the key. You know, so so every, everybody knows that that's important, and penalties that are enforced. Um, uh, in fact, uh, you you fix that. You have mandatory fee shifting. Uh, you increase compliance greatly. Um, I uh, like to scribble down the term sunshine policy center. And it seems like to me there would be two pieces of the legislative. I, I think courts and litigation is important. You know, who's on your Supreme Court? Who, uh, you know, where, what are their positions on? What's their track record on cases on uh, uh, sunshine laws? Because you can have a good open records law, which we pretty much have in Ohio, for example, and you can have years of Supreme <coughs> court decisions. And we've really tried to focus on the Supreme Court and have some success. Uh, the other comment I want to make is that if we're going to think that big, if NFOIC is the logical place for this thing to be housed, uh, it's not going to be solved here. I'm, I'm sure you've had that discussion, but whether it's the board or some working committee, I mean, it really needs a lot of fleshing out. What does that look like? And who's the most impressive and legitimate organization to go to these funders to you know, build an endowment of that of that size, which is you know a huge reach from uh, you know, and I agree that's gettable in that world, but it's a huge reach for anything any anyone in our realm has been involved in. That's a really good point, and it's going to take partnerships. The funders they keep repeating partnering, collaboration, that sort of thing. Um, 
the thing that we don't want to do or no group really should do is try to hog and dominate and take over. Um, that kind of thing, while it may play out in the short term, uh, there are some groups in our galaxies that have reputations and people know who not to play with and reputations get out and, and we don't want to be that. So we want to work with um, who makes sense and collaborate so we're not duplicating efforts so that we're building on our strengths and not wasting resources and coming up with great ideas to where the funders say, yeah, that's, that's a combination that has POW and we'll put money behind it. I think NFOIC personally uh, is poised to, to be a part of that. I, I think now is a really good time for NFOIC given the shift to civil society and away from journalism a little uh, to some extent to, to, to be a big player and, and, and we will be working on that, the board over the next year, uh, identifying potential funders, projects, we're going deeper. Now that Dan and Mal and Mark and others have situated the, the uh, structure of the organization well, it, it's, it's time to really move on those projects that can make a difference. And I, I think it's possible. I mean, don't, don't hold me to it, but um, I hope five years from now, uh, whether it's NFOIC or some other organization or a combination, uh, will have achieved something substantial that moves the needle in this direction. That's, that's my hope. So when you were showing that, the chart of the fundraising, right? A lot of the groups which have increased their funding the most seem to be ones that have super tangible things that they're able to show. I mean, ProPublica, it's almost not fair, but they produce stories, right? RCFP does litigation. You didn't mention uh, the Committee to Protect Journalists, but they've got a ton of money lately, and they have a very specific thing they do. So what would you recommend to the groups in this room? How, how, how do organizations that are involved at the state level in the FOI, how do they make that tangible case that, that gets funders to understand What's up and why they want That's a really good point, Mark. I mean, and we have to figure that out. I mean, Open the Government did a study where they tried to figure out what resonates with people when it comes to FOI, uh, what, what kind of hits home and gets them jazzed. Uh, that's a good study, and, and they came out with some good recommendations. We need to build on that and work on that and figure out, figure out how to sell, sell this. Uh, I think a lot of you in this room do that very well. You know, you've done it long enough. You know what hits home with a legislator, uh, what doesn't. Uh, those are the kind of things we have to bottle and then uh, spread around for everyone else and sell. Um, and so what is it? Well, what do we have to sell? You know, fighting government corruption, making government accountable and good, I don't know. It doesn't resonate as well we find in our research, the, the high lofty democratic principles uh, don't resonate as well with the average Joe as some other uh, appeals. Uh, but, but we do have to nail that down. Um, uh, or we can have Meryl Streep just give a shout out to us at the Golden Globes, like uh, happened to uh, uh, Reporters Committee, um, CPJ, uh, Committee to Protect Journalists. Their s supporters went from 2,000 to 13,000 in two months. Um, they had so many donations flowing in, they had a backlog, they couldn't process them. Um, so, uh, we'll work on Merrill. A good problem to have, right? Anyone else? What should we be selling? What is the message that we're going to Well, the, the research shows and this only supplements what you know and you know in your gut and your experience but it's practical stuff that hits home with average people public safety issues are number one they're the things that concern people records that involve their public safety crime in their neighborhood thing yeah you know, fear fear works effectively we found uh our presidents found that to be an effective um technique to motivate some people. So, um, and, and we know that in the, in the persuasion literature that, that those sort of appeals are effective. Uh, there, there are other kinds as well. Uh, certain things 
turn people off, we know. Talking about access to divorce files or uh, records that make people feel squeamish. There's a privacy element and people don't like that. So, so we already know, I think, to some, to some level what can hit home and what doesn't. We should test some of that, frankly, and that hasn't been done yet. We need to test appeals to see what actually works, experiments, that sort of thing. We have a lot of, a lot of research to go, or we could just kind of go with our guts, too. But, uh, um, but I like a combination of those two. Anyone else? All right. Well, Dave, thank you so much. And any ideas of uh, when you're going to nail down the report? Well, that's a good idea. Um, it's in Knight's hands, and um, so I'm not sure exactly, but we'll let everybody know. And uh, you'll probably be mostly interested in the Excel file that'll be posted with it online, so you can download and look at everybody else. Um, also, I'll include lists of foundations and alternative funders that you may not be aware of. Um, you know, I want to provide ideas and, and practical information that you can use for your coalitions and, and other groups. It's not just for NFOIC. Um, it's for everybody to look and see what's going on and share and maybe team up and work together and let's make this stronger. Yeah, I, th I think the, uh, what, what was interesting with your 2017 report your focus was on our target audience out there in terms of the public institutions and some of the changes that need to be addressed here. And now this one is kind of an internal review of what's going on and some of the other things. So not to put the 2017 report aside because NFOIC has embraced a number of those things that you came out uh, in terms of recommendations that we are incorporating into our strategies. And so, you know, that's something that we can almost use as, as a complementary piece to what you're doing here with this latest report. So thank you very much for the research you're doing on this. Sure. And thanks to you all for answering my surveys or talking to me or just uh, giving me feedback. Uh, and feel free to email me. And uh, thanks for all the work you do in your states. It's important. It, it, it's more important than ever. And uh, know, that, that, know that it matters. All right, thank you. Now, we'll, yeah.